Hey, it's Heidi. Welcome back for another video. I'm so glad that you're here. You clicked on this video today because you are in a relationship of some kind with an addict or an alcoholic, and you're wondering if all the work you're doing over time you're putting in to control this addiction or try to get a handle on it in any way you can is actually helping or hurting. And we're going to answer that question today along with what is enabling and how does controlling play a role in all of that. I just want to take a minute and say I'm so glad that you're here, that you found this channel, and I, how much I appreciate your comments because every, you might not know this, but every time you make a comment on uh, a video, it helps it get seen more. And YouTube is such a big place, and we have such a big mission here at Love Coach Heidi to help people break these toxic, dis dysfunctional patterns for good. So you're helping us not only by us letting us help you, but when you comment and like the video, it helps us help more people. So I just want to say how much I appreciate that. And of course, I love to read the comments because I'm, I'm happy the videos are helping. I mean, that's the whole reason I show up here. As always, if you want to go deeper with us, you can go over to lovecoachheidi.com or you can have head over to revolutionaryfamilyprogram.com where you can have everything that I'm talking about and every single one of these videos in one spot, plus much, much more. So welcome home, guys. Today, we're going to be diving into this conversation about control. If you're new here, we talk about everything dysfunctional and toxic relationship. Our goal is to help you overcome codependence. And people don't understand codependence. You know, codependence is just a way to function in dysfunction. We take on this personality or this role we play in order to cope and survive and, and connect and do all the things we want to do. And controlling is a form of codependence. So we're going to break this down today. We're going to talk about how do we try to control the addiction? What are some of the ways? So maybe you're recognizing, you're not even recognizing your behavior as controlling. You think it's just being helpful or damage control or however you look at it. So if I call out a behavior and I call this out on this list I'm going to go over with you, you can rest assured that that is actually codependent behavior. And we're going to get into then what to do about it. Because they're, they, look, you're here because why are you doing this? Why are you controlling the behavior to begin with or trying to control it? Because let's be real, there's a lot on the line here. When you love somebody that's addicted, I mean, I don't have to tell you the feelings that go along with that. I mean, the anxiety is outrageous. It'll keep you up at night, scratching your head, wondering when's it going to get the, when are you going to get the call? You know, when are things going to go, when are they not going to make it home? Or God forbid, if they're out, are they coming home? And what's going to happen if they do? It's really maddening. It can make you feel like you're in a battle without weapons. You know, you just don't know. One minute you can do something that seems helpful, and the next minute you can do it, and it seems like the absolute wrong thing to do. And, and I wish it were more black and white. Some things are. Some things I can tell you in the decade of experience that I've had when I worked as a teacher and a coach inside one of the world's leading drug and alcohol treatment centers. You know, I, I worked with thousands of clients there and hundreds of families. And I have to tell you, there are some pretty like, yep, don't do that things, right? Or yep, do that things. But in the, in the middle is this gray area where I want to help you try to figure out what it is that you believe in doing, not what you think is going to keep somebody sober, but what it is that you believe in at night so that you can sleep at night knowing you're doing everything you can because you want to get your loved one back. It's kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde, isn't it? You know, especially if you've experienced them sober, you're thinking, man, I, I know the person that's in there. You just want to shake them awake. You know, you just want to go, man, just like you have so much potential just to be the person that I know you can be. But here they are like hijacked and, and, and acting like the addicted personality, which looks just like a narcissist, by the way, addiction and narcissism mirror each other. They look the same. And so the effect on you is the same. You're suffering the same as somebody in a narcissistically abusive relationship. You're suffering the same in this addicted, abusive relationship. But it's like we keep forgiving them because we go, oh man, they're addicted. I guess, you know, they can't help themselves. And so you, or you think they can, but they're, they're not, you know. We really need to get a handle on this because it's not just killing you. It's killing everybody around us, right? Because addiction affects the whole entire system, not just the person who's using. It really is. It's traumatic for everybody that's experiencing it. So 
Let's dive in. I'm going to talk about some of the things I've personally done in order to control addiction, uh, somebody else's addiction, and some of the things that my students and clients have told me over the years through our programs and courses of what I hear. If at any time you're interested in deep deepening your dive with us in one of our courses or programs, you can have, head over to Revolutionary Growth. Um, dot com or revolutionary family program dot com. Actually, that's where it's at revolutionary family program dot com. And I'll put them in the comments. Okay. So we're going to talk about this controlling codependent. And I remember, you know, when I was a little girl, uh, my dad used to have hiding spots for his alcohol. And, I, you know, sometimes they would be obvious places, but sometimes they wouldn't be so obvious. And one of the places that he liked to hide his alcohol was behind the toilet seat, thinking nobody's going to go behind there, behind the toilet tank. Well, until the toilet breaks and you're brave enough as a little girl to get back there and say, how does this thing work? Well, one of these, one of those days I actually did um, take the lid off and lo and behold, there's a bottle of vodka in there just kind of chilling. And I remember thinking, uh, man, wow. First of all, I was surprised because I thought he just was drinking beer. So one of the rules of thumb is for every, it's like alcoholism and addiction is like cockroaches. For every one you see, there's hundreds more. You know what I mean? So if we're like finding one bottle of vodka, there are many, 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 many more, but we sometimes don't believe it's as bad as that. And it is, I'm telling you, it is. Anyway, I remember thinking to myself, man, if I could just, if my dad knew that I know that he's hiding this, I will shame him or embarrass him into quitting. So I had this bright idea to dump the liquor bottle out and dump it down the drain and put the empty bottle back, you know, as like a, a signal. So then sure enough, I go back in there and there's a full bottle. And I thought, oh, well, maybe he just thought he drank it all. Let me try something else. So I, I dumped the bottle out and then I threw the bottle away thinking no, that surely now he'll know it was me that took that bottle out of there. He'll be so embarrassed and he'll love me so much that he will feel ashamed of himself and he'll, he'll quit, you know? And, you know, lo and behold, as soon as I could bat an eyelash, here it was filled back up again with vodka. And as a kid, you're not going, oh, I guess, um, uh, I guess he's an alcoholic and he can't really control that. And there's this compulsion to drink in spite of co negative consequences. I think, well, gosh, I guess my dad doesn't love me enough because he must've known it was me. And I think even adults, as we think that too, we think, man, they're, they, if they just loved us enough, you know, they would stop. In fact, there's other videos on my channel about why don't, if they loved us enough, will they quit? because it's a lot of things other, a lot of us believe. But how about you? Have you dumped liquor bottles down the drain? Have you marked the liquor bottle with a marker thinking if I can just see how much they're drinking and measure it out and then point it out to them? Hey, this bottle was this full yesterday. It's this full today. Do you know how much you're drinking? You know, an alcoholic doesn't <laughs> care how full the bottle is. They just, if it's empty, they fill it up. You know I mean? They're, they're not thinking in terms like that. But I, as a little girl thought that he might, you know, just be, if he could just notice how much he was drinking. In fact, when he would go to bed, his beer cans would be kind of in the trash. I would take his beer cans out of the trash. And he, my dad was a functioning alcoholic, meaning he, what's functioning. He went to work every day. Okay. And saved his, his drinking for when he got home. But I used to line the beer cans up at the bottom of the steps like a beer tower, like a house of beer cans, thinking, hey, if you just will come downstairs and be confronted with his problem in the morning when he's sober, again, I can shame him into quitting. And so shame is a form of control. Shaming somebody by pointing out how much they're drinking and embarrassing them with by their drinking and trying to remind them of all the harm they've caused when they're drunk or re reliving the party or the corporate event and telling them how shamed you are. Shaming somebody into sobriety has never worked really. Okay. It's not some, because addiction doesn't care. Addiction has no shame. Addiction doesn't have a shame barometer. That's why it's addiction. That's why it's so insidious is because the chip is missing that makes somebody care. That's why somebody can keep doing the things they're doing and hurting you the way they're hurting you and destroying their lives and the lives of other people because that shame chip, like, oh, the consciousness, oh, this is really screwing up. The addiction doesn't care. And when somebody is addicted, the addicted personality takes over the addicted person. You're not born with an addicted personality. You don't come out of the womb like, eh, more, more, more. You know, that's not how it happens. 
when you become addicted, you develop an addicted personality and an addicted personality looks exactly like a narcissistic personality. They lack empathy. They lack insight into their own behavior. They blame and shame. They project their guilt onto you. It looks exactly like narcissism and you're being gaslit a lot anyway. So you try to shame them back and remind them of all the harm they're causing. And at best, you're just going to get an empty promise from them. You're not going to get anything that's real until they actually get into recovery. So that control with shaming does not work at all with addiction. That chip is missing. Okay. Ultimatums are another way we try to control somebody's behavior. And an ultimatum is very different than a boundary. You know, if you're interested in how to set a boundary, go over to lovecoachheidi.com and take my free masterclass, how to set a boundary. It'll give you the steps because a boundary has a consequence attached to it. It has an action attached to it. An ultimatum really doesn't. It's like, if you do that one more time, we're leaving Disney. And knowing damn well, you're not leaving Disney, right? If you do that one more time, I'm going to turn this car around. You're not turning the car around. You've been waiting for vacation your whole, you, the whole year. That's the same with addiction. You keep threatening to pull the trigger on something and trying to control the behavior, but you never follow through and it never has any, because ultimatums, you know, are, don't mean anything in the grand scheme because it's not about changing or manipulating somebody's behavior. That's what an ultimatum is. An ultimatum is trying to change or manipulate somebody's behavior by threatening that you're going to do something that you're never going to do. And a boundary is you act the way you're going to act. And here's what you can expect from me to protect myself. Not necessarily to change your behavior, but to protect myself in case nothing changes. That's very two different, very thing, two very different things. Another thing that we can do is leave books out. I've had clients and students that have left Bibles out, you know, with verses highlighted or sober for good, or you know, uh, is your drinking? Are you drinking too much? Are you ruining your family? You know, you can put these books out and hope that they'll pick them up. And you'll find that ultimately at the end of the day, the motivation is just not there, you know, for them to pick up that book because they're, again, they're, they're in their addiction and the thinking part of the brain isn't there, which leads me to lecturing, you know, reading a book and lecturing somebody on the impact is when you try to lecture an addict and sit them down and talk to them about their behavior. And especially when they're drunk, if you, you know what I'm talking about, if you've ever tried to have a conversation with an addict or an alcoholic under the influence, it is banana town. But the worst part about it is, is if they're super drunk, you actually feel like you're making headway. You know what I'm saying? Like they'll be like, oh, because they'll start to cry, they're high. And they're like, yeah, I know, I'm ruining everything. I'm ruining the family. And they're, they're fucked up. But you're like, yeah, I'm making some difference. They're, I'm landing. They're high as hell. They're not, there's nothing, <laughs> you're not having any access to any part of them that is actually going to put some dots together in the morning. But we get this false sense that, yeah, we've had this deep conversation when they're under the influence. And, and just know you haven't. No, you haven't. It's kind of like trying to talk to a toddler in the middle of a tantrum. When a toddler is in a tantrum, they're in their limbic system. They're in their feelings. They're like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And you try to sit down and go, Johnny, do you see what your behavior is doing to the family? Wah! You know, they're all in their emotions and in their feelings. And whenever somebody is high, their neocortex is hijacked too, just like a toddler's is. So you really don't have any access to that part of the brain. So lecturing is futile. It's absolutely pointless. Now, let's say that when somebody gets into recovery, you start to try to control their recovery as well. So is controlling helping or hurting? Well, Heidi, okay, I get it. I'm not supposed to try to control how much they use. Oh, by the way, let me remind myself. That includes doling more ways we control use and recovery. I'm going to do both. Using, we control that by trying to dole out the pills. We try to put them in a safe and give them every four hours or six hours or just give them an out of van when they're really freaked out or have let, keep beer in the house and not hard liquor. We try to find ways to minimize the amount that they're using. And some of us have even gone as far as actually using substances with our loved ones to make sure nothing bad happens. Well, if you're going to get high, just do it here and not out with your friends, or let me drink some beers with you and I'll show you when to quit. Or you know what? The heroin is terrible or the drugs are terrible. Why don't you just smoke pot? And you encourage like switching other addictions. And look, I'm not, I might be calling you out right now and your ears might be ringing or your face might be getting hot and you're thinking, man, I do these things. How bad is this? Well, th at the end of the day, everything that you've been doing calls for some compassion on your part for yourself because everything you've been doing, you've been doing out of a deep desire for everybody to be okay.
including yourself, including everybody else. So there's a hero in you that's trying to get this thing taken care of, buttoned up. Now, controllers are a little more manipulative in the way they do things. They're a little more strategic in the way. There's a little more power trip going on in us that we think we have more power than we actually have. And it's really hard to get to the place where you realize you've done all this efforting and all of this work and trying to control the outcome and the outcome is still the outcome you're not really impacting it. And that can be really hard. So, you know, holding back medication, you can think you're being successful at that, but here's the truth. You can dole out so many pills and they can get them elsewhere and they're still getting high. And you're like, how's this possible? I'm monitoring your medication. Like a cockroach for every one you see, there's hundreds more. Okay. That that's how this thing works. It, it, it's, it's in the dark. It's scat. Everybody scatters. And the truth is really hard to come by. And, and you don't often find the truth, actually. You never really ultimately know just how much or how bad it was, even though you think that you have a lock on it, you really don't. You really do not have an understanding of how much. And I say that to you out of love so that you can know the things you think you are controlling, there's many, many other things that you're not, okay? Now, one more controlling before we move into the recovery, controlling addiction. You might have uh, kids in your house, you know, and they're having feelings about the addict or alcoholic, especially if it's a parent or a sibling, and they're feeling some type of way about it, but you're trying to control how they see things. You're trying to control how they feel about things or what they think about things. And this could be positive or negative. You could be telling them, well, he's a drunk, he's an alcoholic, he's a no good, and they're going, yeah, yeah, you know, and you're fueling that fire. Or you might be saying, dad's fine, there's nothing wrong, nothing to see here, sweeping it up, pretending that everything is okay. And either way, or you shouldn't feel that way. If they get upset, you're telling your kids, well, you shouldn't feel that way. You know, you're telling everybody how to feel, think, act, and behave. And that's a form of a controlling codependent that is, is very hurtful for everybody in the family because we all need to have our own feelings around this. It affects everybody in a different way. We all need a safe outlet to be able to express how this affects us. That's exactly why we have our family program and our support group that meets every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. so that we can talk about you know how to go through this and get the strategic advice that we need in order to actually be making the impact that we wanna make. Now, controlling is just one way we do this. You know, I, I've been studying this for most of my life. I've dedicated to understanding codependence and dealing with addiction in the family. And I have extensive education. And through this experience, I've come up with eight different ways that we are codependent in these relationships. And a controlling codependent is just one. There's also a fixer, a fixing codependent that behaves differently in addiction. There's a pleaser, a people pleaser codependent that behaves differently in addiction. There's a withholder that behaves differently. There's a clinger that behaves differently. There are eight different patterns. Now, not to overwhelm you, but you can go over to lovecoachheidi.com and download the free book, Um, attachment personality patterns, identifying your codependency programming, and start to see other members of the family, your sibling, the siblings, the children, you start to see kind of everybody in the family dynamic. And I'm going to be doing lots more videos as well. So I think that that, I think that that covers trying to control their use. So, so far, if you're saying to me, check, oh my gosh, you know, check, check, I definitely have been behaving this way, it's a really good time for you to consider allowing somebody to come alongside of you and give you the support that you need. Now, this is really hard when I invite people to come into the program or to get more support or assistance. It's hard for for people that are dealing with addiction to like make that switch in our heads because there's a lot of anger and you have every single right to be pissed off, traumatized. I mean that that's you are a victim in this situation for absolute sure. Okay? So but with that becomes this well, I shouldn't have to get help. They're the problem. They need to go get better. They need to go get treatment. They're the ones that are creating all this, Heidi. I am not. Why should I have to go work on myself or learn about this or do whatever? Um, And I'm going to just give you one simple answer. And and this really covers everything because honest to goodness, this has impacted you in ways you don't even know. And you need to get better whether they get better or not. 
because I don't know what's going to happen with your loved one. I really have no idea and neither do you. This could be a long ride. This could be the rest of your life dealing with this or if you decide to leave the relationship even and move on or do no contact, there's fallout here. You've been in a war and there's shrapnel and you need a professional to come alongside you and pick that shrapnel out so that you can go on and learn how to get your peace back. A lot of a lot of people think, well, when this addiction is fixed, I'll get my peace back. But I'm going to tell you what right now, that anger is still there. The resentment is still there. The pain is still there. The children's issues are still there. All the things are still there, even though an addict gets into recovery. Okay. So I want to encourage you to check out our program, revolutionaryfamilyprogram.com, or send me a private message, schedule consultation, and we can get you the support that you need. In the meantime, the free videos I know are super helpful, all right? And at least coming back, keep coming back to these because I think that these are going to continue to help you as well, all right? So let's talk about now trying to control somebody's recovery and how that's not necessarily helpful and why it's not helpful and why it might even be hurtful, Okay. Some of the things that we do when people get into recovery is we get obsessed first about figuring out their recovery program. Now, the only time that you want to be figuring out with an addict or an alcoholic is when they're active in addiction and you guys need to find a place for them to get better. That's a wonderful time for you to be supportive and encourage them and figure out, you know, where their insurance takes or if they're cash pay or where they're going to go and help orchestrate that. It's a wonderful thing for you to support them in recovery, right? We're not supporting the addiction, we're supporting recovery. Getting involved in the family program, getting with a coach, getting with your own program, and getting to your own recovery program is a great move. But outside of you working your own recovery program, you are not to work harder on their recovery program than they are. And that happens all the dang time including they get out of treatment and you're like, okay, well, I've got a list of all the local AA meetings and I found the, all the people that I think that you should start hanging out with. And by the way, I went into your Facebook and your social and I deleted all the friends, you know, all the people that I thought were bad for you. And I messaged, I know that one person was a drug dealer and I messaged that person and I told them to have absolutely no contact with you. So don't worry, I've taken care of that as well. I'm gonna drive you to your first meeting. It starts at 7 p.m. I figured we'll have a good dinner. We'll go to the meeting. I'll sit outside and wait for you. And then as soon as that meeting is over, I'll pick you up so you're not even tempted. Outside of that meeting, you just get straight in the car. We'll stop for ice cream, good boy. And then we will go home. Now, please know that if we're not laughing at the things that we've done, we're crying, okay? So if you see yourself in this at all, on any stretch of the imagination, please understand that is not helpful. Recovery is an inside job. If you're figuring out all the meetings and you're driving to the meetings and you're sitting outside and waiting, you're trying to control the outcome of that recovery and that is not helpful. The person who's in recovery is the one that needs to be finding the meetings, getting the rides, raising his hand, asking for help, getting a ride home, making friends. You know, it's really is up to them. And that is the scariest part because you think, well, if I don't remind them, hey, did you go to, did you go to your, um, your, your meeting today? Hey, did you go to celebrate recovery? Hey, did you go to AA? Hey, did you meet your therapist? You know, and if you think unless you're like doing a chore chart, they're not going to be doing the work. And I have to tell you that may or may not be true. But even if you drive them to the meeting, if they're not making the effort to go, what they're doing in the meeting is a whole other story. What they're doing in therapy is a whole other story. So can you support recovery? Sure, if they ask you, hey, I really need to get to this meeting, but here's the rule of thumb. You should be the last person they ask when it comes to working at their recovery because you're not a sponsor. You're not a halfway house. You're not a therapist. You're not a life coach. And even if you are, you're ill-equipped because you're too close to this situation. So when they get into recovery, and I have other videos of what does recovery look like and why do people relapse out of treatment. So look, subscribe, watch all these other videos, or again, consider coming alongside of us in our program. I'm not going to stop asking you because everything is in one place, plus hours and hours of coaching that's going to support you in your journey. All right. So here's the deal. 
You don't need to find the meetings. They need to find the meetings. You do not need to get the rides. People in AA love to give rides, okay? Being of service as part of the program. You know, them working the program is the whole deal. So, you know, tracking the fo- tracking their car, putting the little monitor on their phone to see where they're at, you know, locking out the friends. You know, these types of behaviors give you the illusion and delusion of control. They make you think that you're making some headway and they make you feel a little bit better. They give you a little bit of peace because you feel like at least something's in control because you're doing something. But here's the question. How's that working? Is it working? If it worked, they'd be sober already a long time ago. So the best thing to do is to give them over their addiction and give them over their recovery, and you find out what you need to do to figure out how to navigate that addiction and navigate that recovery and be the best version of you committed to your mental health, emotional health, financial well-being, physical well-being, while they're deciding how they're going to get better. You know, this is, that can be done. I promise you, I've worked with hundreds of clients and I've seen it firsthand over the last decade of families where peace is restored. You can have a peaceful home and if you know exactly how to navigate this thing and what to, what boundaries are right for you and how to set those boundaries and hold those boundaries and keep those boundaries, and that's exactly what we can help you do. All right, good talk. Good talk. You know, I know maybe you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, like, wow, I, I tick it off this list. And, but you know, look, that's great because awareness is step one, knowing how you're showing up in this and maybe contributing in a hurtful way. It's, it's harmful. It's not helpful. And knowing that there is a way on the other side to get the information that you need and the support you need to, to actually be helpful. That's encouraging too, right? I promise you there's peace waiting for you on the other side. I love you so much. Take excellent care of yourself. Remember to leave me a comment or send me a private message over um, on any platform, Love Coach Heidi. You can find me anywhere, schedule a consultation. I look forward to deepening our relationship and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.